Hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly lean on Jesus' name On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. In Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His old is covered in his blood. Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay In Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand And he shall come with trumpet sound And may I bid in him be found Trust in his righteousness alone, all this I stand before the throne. In Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you for that. Learning to lean. Learning. to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dream. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, learning to lean, learning to lean, learning to lean. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, thy fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning his mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. 
summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning his mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to God. Drink for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousands beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. That was beautiful. What a beautiful truth. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people, we declare your mighty words. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was in you. Amen. 
Sing this with us. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance. After the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. There's just something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. A fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. There's just something about that name. Sing it all together. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. You're our master, our savior, Jesus. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. There's just something about that name. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. Today we'll be... <clears throat> 
looking at the book of Matthew. But before we get started, there's, there's a couple of things I'd like to ask. First of all, uh, most of you know I'm a, I'm a seminary student and I'm attending seminary, uh, hoping to go into the field of pastoral ministries. Uh, but with that, I'd like to ask you today, this isn't something that I do on a normal basis, so I'd just like to ask for a little bit of grace from you guys as, as I share God's Word today, uh, in case I stumble or fumble along the way here. Uh, but also, secondly, please, be, be accepting of God's Word as, as, as I proclaim it to you, but go home, read God's Word after today, and make sure that the things that I say are true. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get started. Dearly Father, Lord, I just, again, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity. And, and Lord, I, I pray that uh, as we hear your words, Lord, that it won't be something that comes into our heart empty, Lord, but something that fills our hearts, Lord, and, and, and works from our hearts and out into our lives, Lord. I thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus teaches that uh, having a genuine relationship with God is of the utmost importance. And because of this, Jesus commands his followers. We see this in John 15, 12. Love one another as I have loved you. You see, like Jesus, we're to, we're to follow Jesus in the way that he lived and the things that he has, he has done. And, and Jesus, who lived a life, who spared no expense in loving humanity as he willingly gave himself, so that people would have an opportunity to have this genuine relationship with God. And time and time again, Jesus would tell others what it meant to have this relationship with God. And we see in Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50, that Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people when his mother and his brothers arrived. And, and they arrived where Jesus is speaking. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, and we'll look at verses 46 through 50. Okay, here it starts. He was still speaking to the crowds when suddenly his mothers and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak with you. But he replied to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards the disciples, he says, here are my, bro my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven that person is my brother and sister and mother. You see, Jesus' mother and brothers are standing outside of where Jesus was speaking. And through Jesus' response, we find that a relationship between himself and his followers is more profound than being connected through a bloodline. And as far as the Israelites that are standing there, that, are, that, that notice and see what's going on here, this is very important for them to understand. And it's important because some Israelites in Jesus' time, they considered themselves connected to Jesus because they were of a Jewish descent. So when we find Jesus' family asking for someone to go inside so that Jesus would come out and talk with them, Jesus' response is, who is my mother and who are my brothers? If you are my mother and my brothers, why are you on the outside? You don't need a go-between. If you're my family, you can come directly to me. And this is why Jesus motions to his disciples and states, here are my mothers, here are my brothers. So Jesus' response, it stresses the importance of having a genuine relationship with God. And a genuine relationship with God cannot exist or does not exist because an individual is born into a family. Now, R.T. France, who wrote a commentary on the book of Matthew, he comments on this subject and he states, there is tie closer than that. Of, there is a tie closer. Excuse me, let me just start that over. There is a tie that is closer even than that of a family. This tie is a love for God, which extends for love for others. This love, as the Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, is patient. This love is kind. This is a love that does not envy. It's not boastful. It's not conceited. It does not act improperly. This love is not selfish. And so the true sign of one who has a relationship with God is found in one who loves 
like Jesus loved. The opposite of love, then, is to be conceited and selfish. And today, and in Jesus' time, many professing followers of Christ have failed to love and thus prevented people from entering a genuine relationship with God. Now, Jesus takes note of this error in Matthew 21, 12 through 17, and this is where we're going to uh, look. This is the text that we're going to look at today and, and see how Jesus takes action. So if you would, turn with me to Matthew 21, and we'll look at verses 12 through 17. So Jesus went into the temple complex, and he drove out those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money-changing tables and chairs and those selling doves, and he said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple complex, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did, and the children in the temple complex cheering, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus told them. Have you never read? You have prepared praise from the mouths of children and nursing infants. And then he left them. He went out to the city of Bethany, and he spent the night there. So what we find here, we find Jesus recognizing the hypocritical followers of God were preventing others from coming to him. Jesus, the Son of God, he cleanses the temple area, and he allows healing to those who were once considered unimportant by society. So let's kind of look at the context of the, and the situation that is going on here. It's it's Palm Sunday. Jesus, Jesus had just made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem riding upon a donkey. And he proceeds to fill the, fulfill Old Testament prophecies about the promised Messiah. Now, now, the promised Messiah is something we see that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, where Adam and Eve fell, and God makes a promise that there will be one who will come to bring restoration between humanity and God. And here Jesus is now fulfilling this prophecy. And according to uh, the theologians Bill and Carson, after entering Jerusalem, Jesus heads for the temple precincts where he creates a disturbance by evicting merchants and money changers and overturning tables and chairs that they were using for hawking wares. You see, Jesus attested to the activities that were going on at the temple because it prevented people from coming to God. It prevented people from praying to God. As Bill and Carson continue, they say, if rabbinic sources can be trusted, Caiaphas, who is the high priest at the time, had quite recently moved the trade of sacrificial animals from the Kidron Valley into the very court of the temple, which was designed for God-fearing Gentiles and, and allowed them a, a, an area where they could come in and pray and worship God. You see, the problem with, with bringing this trade of sacrificial animals in, in the temple was that it, it took up space where people could come and, and engage in their worship with God. Mark eleven seventeen says, he, he kind of adds clarity to this thought where he says, where it says, it is, not, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? You see, the problem here is that the high priest, Caiaphas the high priest, his job was to reflect God's image to all nations. And, and, but in return, he's taken and he's twisted God's word. And, and now he's excluding all nations, and in fact, even Israel, because he's teaching Israel uh, a word of God that is not true. And he's, 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 taking people, um, he's teaching people and he's leading them away from God rather than to God. And so now as we see as the high priest excludes nations from coming to God, Jesus quotes from the, from the Old Testament regarding his temple, and he states, you have made it a den of thieves. Now the temple, as previously stated, was to be a house of prayer. Yet many working in the temple had exchanged their relationship with God in order to gain some temporary gain, whether that, be, whether that would be wealth or fame or some type of privilege within that society. 
Now due to this, Jesus proclaims that they're turning his, de- his temple into a den of thieves. And according to Bill and Carson, again, the, the term thieves, as other translations would describe it, if you have a King James Version, I believe it's, the term is, is robbers. And it's, this, this term is more naturally taken as an insurrectionist. But what is an insurrectionist? An insurrectionist is someone who rebels against government or authority. But for one to, re- for one to rebel, they must understand what they're rebelling against. You see, a rebel is not one who blindly stands against the authority, but a rebel is one who understands the terms and conditions of the relationship between the one in authority and those under that authority. The term insurrectionist is used in this, used in this passage would imply that the high priest, including individuals who are, would, would include the individuals selling in the temple, it, it states that they know the truth, but they're unwilling to stand against it. And they're unwilling to stand against it because they hope to, to retain a profit or to gain something in some way. You know, we find individuals and organizations doing the same thing today. There are some religious organizations that, they, that take people's money claiming that an individual will, will be forgiven or offered specific blessings as, as they give money to this organization. Other organizations claim that by performing rituals and prayers, by doing certain things, an individual can receive blessings and forgiveness. And while this may hit closer to home, we see this in, in large part today where some evangelical organizations claim that one will be closer to God if they conform to the world's values. When in reality, we know this not to be true. And, and in fact, the opposite is true where the closer the one gets to the world, the farther they, they are from God. Now, as Jesus, as Jesus found a rebellious high priest conforming to the world's ways in his time, we find a, another example in the Old Testament through the prophet Isaiah, who recognizes a revolutionary people in his time. You see, God's chosen Israelites had become rebellious as they began to conform to the world's practices. And if you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 3. In Isaiah chapter 30, it begins, Woe to the rebellious children. They carry out a plan, but not mine. Now, isn't that interesting? Here, here we see these, these people, the Israelites, are carrying out a plan, but it's not God's. And how many times have we in our lives or, or other religious organizations, how many times have we seen them begin to carry out a plan before they first come to God and ask God, what is your will? So here, here are the Israelites carrying out a plan, but that are not God's. It says they make an alliance, but against my will, piling sin on top of sin. You see, they've, they've built a plan, the Israelites have, but they've, they've come up against an obstacle. And because this obstacle is in the way, they've chosen to turn to the left hand or to the right hand, and they've said, okay, I'm still not going to turn to God. I'm going to do things my way. And here they are piling sin on top of sin. Verse 2 says, they set out to go down to Egypt without asking my advice in order to seek shelter under Pharaoh's protection and take refuge in Egypt's shadow. So again, we know where the Israelites come from. Those, those of us that, that know the Bible, we know that God had taken them out of, from being enslaved from Egypt and taken them out of Egypt in the Exodus. And yet here they are going right back, desiring to go right back to where they, they had started to go back and make an alliance with people who had, ens- who had enslaved them. And verse 3 shows what will happen. It says, But Pharaoh's protection will become your shame, and refuge in Egypt's shadow your disgrace. So when we walk away from God, when we choose to do things our way, it, we, we can see from God's word that it will always end in our shame and our disgrace. So in Isaiah 30, 1 through 3, we find a people who know God, 
but have turned away and are now walking away from God. And as they walk away from God, they begin to lead others with them. So the commonality between the high priest and the Israelites in Isaiah's time and some evangelical organizations today is, they, is that they teach a gospel that doesn't exist. They take God's word and they twist it and they turn it to fit their desires. Now, throughout history, God has promised a Messiah who would come and restore a relationship between humanity and himself. And there's a quote of mine that comes from a, from a teacher of mine in seminary who says, there are two terrible things that happen. And maybe some of you guys have heard this before, but there are two terrible things that happen when we get the gospel wrong. There's two terrible things that happen when we twist God's word. First, when we get the gospel wrong, people are not saved. And people can't be saved because we're leading them away from God. We're not leading them to God. And then secondly, when we get the gospel wrong, God is not glorified. He's not glorified in us walking away from him. And when God is not glorified, it means that someone or some organization is seeking to steal God's glory. Instead of, instead of revealing to the world that God is the only way, and God is the one to, that, that should receive the glory. They're taking it and trying to pile it upon themselves. And hence the reason that Jesus throws these insurrectionists out of the temple. And as Jesus throws, out, throw these, throws these individuals out who are leading people away from God, his actions allow those considered, his actions allow those who are considered unimportant now to enter into the temple those people who are being led away or those people who are being pushed away now can come to Jesus. And now as Jesus reveals the gospel for what it is, his work at the temple reveals an opportunity not just for Israel, but for all nations to know God. And as Jesus begins to heal the lame and the blind, this, this portion of scripture is, is, is essential. And it's essential for us to understand because Back in King David's time, when, when he was king, he failed to produce God's word ideally in his life. And although I would never consider David to be an insurrectionist, because David was considered to be a man after God's heart, this, his actions tell us how important it is to rightly divide the word of God. According to 2 Samuel verses, or chapter 5, verse 6, when King David is marching towards Jerusalem, the Jebusites who reigned in Jerusalem at the time, they say to King David, you will never get in here. Even the blind and the lame can repel you. And now after David captures Jerusalem, he declared, the blind and the lame will never enter the house. Since that day, King David's de declaration stood, and it did not allow the blind and the lame access into the temple. But at this moment, at the moment that Jesus is standing in the temple, the temple is finally serving its purpose. And the temple's purpose was to allow people of all nations an opportunity to worship and pray to God. And as the chief priests and the scribes, they, they watch Jesus perform miracles in, in the temple, they become angry and they ask Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? The children are proclaiming Hosanna to the son of David. And the opposition of these self-professing followers of God seems unending. The children who may have been considered incapable of worship by the chief priests and the scribes, seem to understand Jesus. You know, R.T. France states, it would be surprising if Jesus did not have a noising following, even if there was not much theological depth to the acclamation. But for the ability of the children to perceive spiritual truth, which the learned failed to grasp. This oppos opposition to Jesus, it did not come from those who were ignorant or unlearned, as one might expect. These chief priests and scribes, they, they had been taught the word of God. They, they had learned this through many years of their life. But this, this opposition comes from them who, who have been learned. 
And, and as this opposition comes to Jesus, coming from self-professing followers of God, they have failed to follow the greatest commandment of all, which is to love God and to love people. And as children proclaim, Hosanna to the Son of David, Jesus, quoting from the Old Testament, Old Testament replies to the chief priests and the scribes who were taking offense to the children's proclamation, saying, have you never read? It wasn't that they haven't read, but Jesus is saying, come on, you need to understand this. Have you never read? You have prepared praise from the mouths of children and nursing infants. Jesus' Old Testament quote, it comes from Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, which states, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now, the text doesn't say whether the chief priests and scribes, and scribes extend their assault on Jesus here. However, Matthew Henry states this. He says, by repining at Christ's praise, we drive him from us. In other words, when we show discontent or we, we are grieved about what God is, is doing or or or, or planning within our lives, we push God away. And so after Jesus' confrontation with the chief priests and the scribes and the healing of the blind and the lame, he left them, and he goes out into the, to the city, to Bethany, and he spends the night there. So what, what can we take from this today? You see, those people who are buying and selling in the temple, Jesus the Lord of the temple, he drives these people out. And Jesus' temple actions in the temple signifies the coming judgment that will come upon those who deny God, who, those, merch, those like the merchants who falsely proclaim to be followers of God. And in Jesus' time and today, those falsely declaring themselves believers, they work to profit themselves in, in many ways. And these are people who are described in Psalms chapter 10. And if you would, turn with me to Psalms chapter 10, and we'll see how these people are described. We'll be looking at Psalms 10, uh, verses 7 through 11. So Jesus, or well... Understanding what, what these people, how these people are like, or what these people are like, we see in verse 7, cursing, deceit, and violence fill his mouth. Trouble and malice are under his tongue. He waits in ambush near the villages. He kills the innocent in secret places. His eyes are on the lookout for the helpless. He lurks in secret like a lion in a thicket. He lurks in order to seize the afflicted, he seizes the afflicted and he drags him in his tent. He crouches and bends down. The helpless fall because of his strength. And he says to himself, God has forgotten. He hides his face and he will never see. These type of people, they, they believe in illusion. They believe that God doesn't see what they're doing. And, and so they have this, this illusion that, that offers them hope and comfort against the things that they're doing, but when in reality, truth is lying just on the other side of that illusion. And on the other side of that illusion, one finds judgment like those who were driven out of the temple in Jesus' time. Today, those who fall prey to the illusion of the world will one day be forced out of God's kingdom. And as Matthew states in, in Matthew 13, verse 42, God's angels will throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is a judgment and there is a punishment for, for not turning to Jesus. And, it, and, and as we see in, in Matthew uh, 21, verse 13, in Jesus' day, many people, many of the people who are willing to, to, to perform religious work in order to make a profit for themselves we see that some people were overlooked because of this, so, and, and others failed to understand the truth of who God is. 
And today there's a fine line between spreading the gospel and turning the church into a business. In Matthew 28, Jesus clearly defines the role of the church where as he commands the church to go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And the last part is significant. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus, Jesus, whose God has not turned his face on anyone. The words of Jesus' command does not include one to be profitable as you charge people for baptism. And it doesn't, include, it doesn't include one to be profitable as you charge someone to have your sins removed. And it doesn't include someone to be profitable as you teach them the good news. See, it's, it's important to understand that, yes, we have a, a church building and we have to maintain, you know, we have to pay for the lights and we have to main, maintain upkeep on the building. But if we are putting our money here just so we can be comfortable rather than outside where we can be sharing the gospel or, or, or for leaders and pastors within the church so that they can share the gospel to those within the church, then we are doing the same thing. We're failing to share the, the gospel truly and wholly. You see, Jesus offered himself freely to all who would believe. And his church, as his church, we are, we are here to portray Christ by presenting the gospel freely to all who are here. And although performing religious work comes at an expense, that expense should never overlook those in need and never cause one to present the gospel in an untruthful manner. We find this in, in Jesus' day where there were people who, who were considered poor and oppressed, and, and poor as in not, not having the word of God uh, being, being confessed to them. And the people who hear, are, they are lost and they're without hope. And in some cases, the very people who were trained to offer this hope failed to do so. They were failed to do the work that they were called to do. And today we find many people find themselves in the same situation where they're lost and they're living without hope. And yet the words of God spoken through the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah offer us a hope and a future. God says in Isaiah, he says, I am the Lord. This is Isaiah 43, 16 and 19. I am the Lord who opened a way, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you see it? Do you see the work that God has done through Christ? Do you see it? Do you understand this? And Jeremiah continues, he said in 29, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 12, he says, for I know the plans that I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And in those days when you pray, I will listen. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan. He is the promised Messiah, and he offers hope because he has made a way for you and I to have a relationship with God. Now, Jesus' words, have you ever, have you never read? This must have rang loud and clear in the ears of the chief priests and scribes. But they, choose, they chose to reject the importance of God's word. The Apostle Paul says, If the good news we preach, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from those who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds who, of those who don't believe. See, the chief priests and the scribes, they, they, neglected, they, they neglected to seek the truth of God's word. And this, this, led, uh, this led the rebellious leaders to be blinded by the God of this world. Satan, he imprisons the minds of those who choose not to believe. And today the world has chosen to disregard God's word. People decide not to read and accept God's word. And, and because of this, we have entered a time when false teachers freely and falsely proclaim the gospel. And by doing so, they trap many in spiritual darkness. And many false teachers have driven people away from the gospel with vain philosophies and traditions. You know, Jesus warns of these people in Matthew 15, 8, 9. He says, these people honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. 
Now, one example here, uh, just a quick example, might be, you know, hey, listen, if you just say this prayer, you can go to heaven. Here we are honoring God with our lips, but with our heart, we have no desire to know God, no desire to follow God. And, and so, so it's an honoring of God with our hearts, with our, with our lives. Jesus continues on saying, They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Many people proclaim to know God, but they fail to read and understand his word. And because of this, false preachers are gaining grounds in, Christian, in the Christian community today. And the only way for us to discern, the only way for us to know that whether a teaching is false or it's, it's true is to dig into the Bible and reason with God to gain understanding of his word. And one example of a people who are quick to discern God's word are the Bereans. Now in Acts 17, in chapter 17, we find the Bereans. And the Bereans were well known for listening to messages being preached and, and welcoming these messages with eagerness. Yet, they examined the scripture daily to see if these things were true. You see, the Bereans, they were, they were careful to listen to men, such as the, the Apostle Paul. And then they would, they would carefully read God's word to see if what Paul said was valid. And while the Bereans are critiquing people like the Apostle Paul, who today is critiquing people like Joel Osteen, David Platt, or even John MacArthur? Now, Jesus, after... after after he leaves after cleansing the temple. And although the text doesn't explain why, why we can infer that when he left, people are standing in awe of what had taken place. This wasn't a normal day-to-day thing to have someone come in and overturn tables and, and throw people out of the temple. Many people who knew God, who knew God's word, and heard and understand the words of Jesus, as Jesus that day, just like the Israelites in the time of Isaiah, who knew God but chose to be rebellious against God. For those, those, those people who, who won't accept God, Isaiah proclaims as he calls out to a people who disregards the truth. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, he says, Whether you turn to the left or you turn to the right, your ears will hear this voice behind you saying, This is the way walk in it. For those who, je- who rejected Jesus, their, their life went on as usual. There was no real hope. There was no real point of existence. They just continued to follow false philosophies like do what makes you feel good or live your best life now. These philosophies that we see today were around back then. There's, there's no change. It's people doing what makes them feel good. Yet there were others. There were others who heard and responded and found a relationship with God. And this relationship with they, that they found with God is, was engaged in love. And this love, again, as we see in 1 Corinthians 13, is patient. This love from God was a love portrayed by God, like in the time of Isaiah when he, he calls out to the people who blatantly chose to walk away from God. And Isaiah says to the people, that they would hear this voice behind them as they walked away. And we can picture God as he, as he calls back, calls out to them, as, as he calls out to them saying, turn away from your sin. Repent, come back. And whether, whether they would turn to the left or they were turning to the right, God is calling them back to the straight and narrow path, that well-beaten path of the righteous saying, come, follow me. And those who recognized God's voice, they found a love that was not provoked and a love that did not keep a record of wrongs. God didn't chastise them when they turned back to them. He had forgiven their sins. He forgot about that. And this relationship, which is engaged in love, is a relationship that can come only from God who offers an everlasting love that provides you and I hope and a future. So to conclude today, a relationship with God engaged in love, this, this won't end in a, in with Jesus driving you out of his presence, but this relationship will change you. Instead of you living life for yourself, you will see yourself living life for God, choosing to desire what God desires. 
You will find yourself desiring to read the Bible so you can know who God is. And now, in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, since you have heard about Jesus and you have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. And instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Tell your neighbors the truth. And I tell you, now is a time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another second to get to know God or to experience his salvation. Jesus says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Don't allow your sin or the position that you may be at in life prevent you from turning back to God. Whether you know God or you don't know God, do not let that stop you from coming back to God as, he, as he's calling out to you. So if you're here today and, and you don't have a, a relationship with God, I, I will pray that today that, that you will turn to Jesus. And those, those, of a, those of you who may profess to be Christians, but you live in a way that represents the world, again, I pray for you that you will hear God's word behind you and you will turn and you will begin to walk that well-beaten path of the righteous. So today I leave you with, with a question. Will you turn to Jesus today? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would be a church, Lord, that, that does your will, that seeks your will before we move. And, and God, as we move, I pray that we will be constantly uh, seeking your desire, trusting in your word, and, and following uh, in obedience, Lord. And, and Lord, I just, I just pray if there is anyone here today, Lord, that does not know you, or if there are, any, are Christians here who, who you are calling out today, Lord, people who know your word that have turned away from you, God, I pray that, I pray that they will turn around, Lord, and... and and answer your call. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.